Well, good morning, church. So good to, to be with you. Today we finish our series on disciple, and um, I hope that it's been a, a fruitful series for you. I know that as I uh, talk with uh, several, um, each week something has been um, uh, attractive to you, if that's the right word, in a sense of drawing us closer to Christ. And I, I truly, deeply believe that the more we desire the heart of God, um, the, greater, the greater our role will be in the kingdom's purpose. Because as we draw harder, closer to the heart of God, it's, it, it moves away from us and moves in all about him. I want to welcome those that are live streaming with us this morning. We're so glad that you're with us. Uh, today we are celebrating Holy Communion. I want to invite you that uh, quickly go and grab uh, some bread and some juice and celebrate with us at the end of this service as we come together for the Lord's Supper. Also, just a quick reminder to those that are live streaming with us, uh, if you have prayer needs throughout the week, don't hesitate to let us know. Email us, uh, call us, whatever is the most convenient way, drop us a note, whatever is the, the best way for you that we can continue to be your church family uh, located wherever you might be all across this nation and, and even into the world. Well, we are in, like I said, the final week of this series of Disciple, and, and we've talked about some, some pretty significant things. We've talked about um, having a heart for Christ alone, that, that it must start there. And secondly, we talked about a mind transformed by the Word, and we looked at what Paul had to say was what that transformation was, which really was a call to having a heart of worship, a, a, a spirit of worship with God. We looked at uh, Jesus, who as the master washed the feet of his disciples out of John 13. And we realized that, that part of what it means to be a disciple is for us to become servants, to empty ourselves, so to speak, so that we might serve other people. Then we looked at knees of prayer, and we looked at the importance of, of the dedication to a vital prayer life, that, that a disciple makes a commitment to prayer. And a disciple believes that before they even pray that God hears the prayer, and that God draws closer into that relationship with that. Last week, we looked at what it means to love the leader and about how there's a partnership between congregations and pastors of how we come together and fulfill the call of the kingdom's purpose. And today, we're looking at a heart for giving. And uh, you can't be a disciple unless we really get this right. And, and this is one of those things that sometimes um, really uh, frustrates people because they're trying to connect the dots with what that means. So I hope today that as we talk a bit about what it means to have a heart of giving, and through the example of the Macedonian church, I'm really hopeful that uh, all of us would come to a, a different understanding of the power of what it means uh, to be one that truly has the heart who gives. Uh, there's a guy by the name of William Dyerness, and he wrote, How Does America Hear the Gospel? And he observed the following in that production. He said, In many respects, American identity is established in material terms. We define ourselves by our relation to our material environment, perhaps more than our relationship to other people or even our relationship to God. That is, that, that this has resulted in great material prosperity and great technological accomplishment, he writes that we can readily acknowledge that, but we note a dark side as well. Americans invariably tend to endow material means with ultimate or final value. Owning a home, for example, is seen as one of the ends of life rather than as a means to the ends. Meaning is attached to accumulating in a state far beyond what we could conceivably use. He goes on to, to, to point out that, that that also has a, 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 a way in which the gospel is preached, that as pastors are engaging congregations and as pastors themselves living in an American culture, living into exactly what he notes here, how do we communicate a gospel that helps raise the awareness of the people of God when it comes to having a heart of giving? He says, communicating the gospel in America will invariably reflect these emphasis. On the one hand, it will tend to affirm the quest for achievement, meaning that God has created you and therefore go and accomplish what God has. Some would term that as that's communicating a way of achievement. It might emphasize that God loves us and seeks to help us realize our potential of our gifts, that he has this wonderful plan in our life. But on the other hand, it will encourage a practical, no-nonsense kind of faith, a faith that works, 
It will in general affirm the goodness and the value of the person and the created order. He says, as a rule, Christians in America will feel the need of affirmation rather than the need of deliverance. So taking a look at that, of, of how, how American culture strives us to be high achievers and to achieve what we call uh, the emphasis of what the world really is, the things of the world, he says that if we're not careful, that that also pushes us into this desire um, for affirmation from one another rather than a desire of deliverance from our sins which is where God comes into the picture. So it begs a couple of questions this morning. I just kinda wanna throw out a couple of things for us to ponder. Is, is God the great supporter of our goals? That's, that's one question. A second question, is the call to give merely an affirmation of our duty within a society that we live as part of a mutually interdependent created order? Meaning, is it mutually exclusive? Is it the created order that teaches us that, or is it society that teaches us that? And is our giving an expression of our inherent goodness as a person? So when we give, is that part of who we are as a good person? Well, I want to take us to a very important uh, story that the Apostle Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, Paul is um, actually writing to the church in Corinth, his second letter, but there's something about the church in Macedonia where Timothy and Titus are ministering. There's something about that church that catches Paul's eye, especially when it comes to the heart of a disciple when it comes to giving. Paul begins to note that in Macedonia, it is well below the poverty line. So we might think of poverty today as um, below, you know, a certain income level with a number of families, and if you fall below that, you're in, in a level of poverty. Paul notes that in Macedonia, that there are no social services that are happening. There are no ways in which the people who have no means at all can make a living or even a difference in the world. But yet something happens in Macedonia through the life of this church that changes everything. And Paul is communicating to the church in Corinth, not to say that you have to be like the church of Macedonia, but he's lifting up the church of Macedonia as an example of what it means to celebrate in the grace of God. So here's what he writes. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Meaning that people were we're saying, please let us be a part of this giving to God, of this sharing of God's grace for the needs of the saints, of the people of God. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So he says, I know that in Corinth there are gifts of knowledge. He says, I know that there is gift of speech. There is gifts of all these things, but make sure that those don't become the primacy of who you are as your identity. Make sure, he said, that you also excel in this grace of of giving, and that's a very important word, the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the, test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So in other words, the Corinthians of that church were proclaiming to those in the region that they were certainly a people of God, and they were establishing themselves as a believing body. They were proclaiming that as their story. And Paul is saying that I want to make sure that your sincerity is tested, that, that the love that you're comparing with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 
And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Did you catch that? According to your means. Paul is not demanding that it be a certain number, but he says, according to your means, participate in this grace of giving. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable to what one has, not according to what he does not have. And isn't that sometimes what I think um, excludes some of the, the good folks of Christianity, where, where we want to say that it has to be a certain gift, and therefore they can't do that? And they feel like, well, I have no part to, to be a part of God's grace and giving. But Paul erases that here, and he says that it's by the means by which you have. But it's not just by the means by what you have. It is dictated by the willingness in your heart. So we must have a willingness to be generous. And then after having the willingness of generosity, we look at the means by which we've given through which our generosity now comes. Our desire is not that others might be uh, relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, for it's written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. So the Macedonian church is setting a huge example here. And this is a, a crux of what we need to understand um, as disciples of Christ. It is, a, it is actually a what I would call a radical role reversal of the order in which the world's values are because it was out of their abundance in poverty, fueled by their riches of their joy found in God, that that is what led to the wealth of their generosity. Out of their poverty, through their love for God, led to their generous nature as to who they were as the people of God. Giving was not seen merely as um, a compassion for the needy, nor was it simply a, a reflection of, well, I'll be a better person if I do this. The Macedonians' joy led to giving, not the other way around. They saw that because of their love of God, but more importantly of God's grace in their life, what they didn't deserve, what they didn't ask for, but God's unresounding or, or God's tremendous love, that it was through that that they found this desire to be generous in what they did. So, so by participating in this collection, so to speak, of what Paul calls the collection, by doing that, the Macedonians were not trying to, to pay their dues. They weren't trying to make a financial investment. Let me see if I give my money, what's the advance return on my investment of what I do? But instead, they were seeking and savoring the kingdom of God. They gave out of their poverty. They gave out of what God had blessed their means to be. And they did it with a desire in their heart to see the kingdom's work done, not a return on their investment, so to speak. So only the greater treasures of heaven and the kingdom of God can be found free when we have this kind of heart. When we begin to open ourselves to what God is doing in our lives, we see the transformation of that, and therefore we become partners of that. Paul's discussion about the collection, especially with how much to give, is, is, um, is something that I think fuels us out of our sleep as a materialistic people. By nature, as Americans, we are materialistic. Instead of taking the overage of what we have been blessed with and using that to bless the life of someone else or, or the ministry through God, through the local church, we want to take the abundance of what we have and we want to spend it upon our own treasures. We want to spend it upon our own luxuries. We want to spend it upon ourselves. And we come across that way oftentimes, believing that we deserve what we've earned and therefore because I've worked hard and I have earned this, then I deserve the right to spend this on myself over and above what my means might be. So there's a challenge that comes here. It's that lure of materialism that triggers in us some sense of reward. That materialism as we draw toward that, materialism as we desire for that, triggers within us the point that must bring us back 
to do north. Jacques Martin says this, he says, bread for myself is a material question, but bread for my neighbor is a spiritual one. So when I feed myself, that's a material question. But when I feed my neighbor, it moves from a material thing to a spiritual thing. So let me, let me ask a couple of questions again this morning. What would it look like? How could we do more for the work of God if all of us decided to live below our means? Dave Ramsey talks a lot about that. Many people have gone through the Ramsey courses. But what would it look like if we chose to live below our means so that it would free up more for us to do the work of God through the blessings of which we've been given? Something that's very radical with that and something that today's world would call and cry against us in doing that. But yet in Paul's day, that's exactly what the people of Macedonia did. They lived below their means that they may give back to a greatness for the work of the kingdom's purpose. So here's a couple of things I just want to just jot your memory a little bit. A couple of things that I want you to walk away with today about why this was so significant and how the Macedonians not only lived, but how they pursued this grace of God and how it influenced who they were as a people. First, it, they saw it as a means of divine grace. As they saw this, they realized that the generosity was not something of human origin, that the generosity that Paul talks about was something that God was doing in them. The people of the Macedonian church were living within the spirit of the Holy Spirit. They began to see themselves as a key component of the greater good of what God's mission and kingdom's purpose uh, was there. How, how does Paul know that? Because they are in dire straits. They are living below the poverty line. And even through that, he sees how they rise above and that they urgently plead to be involved in a powerful way within the collection. Why the Macedonians give the way that they do becomes a theological issue for Paul. And that's why he says, he ties it back that this is a grace from God, that the people of Macedonia recognize God's grace in their life. They don't serve the church. They don't serve society. They serve God. And therefore, because of the grace that God has given to them, they then use themselves as instruments through the life of their church as a way to influence the society of which they are a part. So we see a great piece of this. But the whole crux of it is they see it as their response to God's grace in their life. Here's a second one. The experience of God's grace filled the Macedonians with joy. It filled them with joy. Their joy obviously did not come because they were financially wealthy. Again, let's measure that to today's standards. We tell ourselves, if I just had more money, if I just had this, or if I just had that, I would be happier in my life. Now don't tell me that there hasn't been a point in time in your life you haven't thought that. There have been times in my life I've thought that. But it kind of goes back to what we learned about Solomon, who, who had everything in the world. Solomon had the greatest, vast, most vast riches of the world, and yet he said in the midst of all of that, there was still something nagging inside of him. There was still something that he felt he was missing, that happiness and joy did not come from there. So we, so we look at this and we say, when it comes to financial giving to the Lord's work through the local church, we need to see it as an act of grace. We need to see that a disciple's life sees that and a disciple steps forward to fulfill what God is having. You see, it's not like people sit in a back smoke-filled room as leaders of the church and say, let's figure out ways in which we can pick the pockets of God's people. The people don't do that. We fulfill the commandments and the commands of what we learn in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, that we know that the heart of God's people is to be a generous people. And when we give, we become more like Jesus. And when we become more like Jesus, we become more like the world in which God had originally intended the world to be before the fall ever happened. And we grow in that grace. As our uh, friends in the 12-step program say, we need to let go and we need to let God. And we need to find ways in, uh, within us to desire to be more generous to the help of others. And when that generosity in us grows, then our influence on others will grow as well. When God is at work in us, when we really let him work within us, he brings forth those characteristics that, that Paul mentions, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. When we learn how to, to depend totally on God's grace, God's grace lives in us, and we emulate that within the world. Now, here's something that I do know. Nowhere in the Bible do I read that Christians cannot have nice things. You know, sometimes I have people ask me, well, if I'm a Christian, am I not allowed to have a house? Am I not allowed to have a car? No, there's nothing in the Bible that says that you can't have nice things. The change and the transformation, though, of a Christian, hopefully, is that our identity is not in those nice things, that we don't covet and want to make a statement such as having the largest house on the block. Look at me, I have the largest house. Or look at me, I have three cars in a four-car garage, and in the fourth place is a boat. You know, it's not to bring attention to that by saying that that's found in our identity. But being a Christian means that we can have nice things. And there's nothing that's wrong with that. It's just that Christians aren't motivated that that's the means of why they believe what they do. Are you connecting the dot there with me? It's important to see that. We don't just uh, do that. We, we desire what God has in our lives. In Acts 2.42, there's a beautiful picture given of the early church. We're told that, that they joined with other believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that they gathered together in a small room, that they broke bread, that they shared the Lord's Supper, and some amazing things began to happen. Beyond that, though, we realized that they were constantly together and they shared all of which they had. Part of the spirit of a disciple is to share, to share that which is the grace of God in our life on behalf of others, and to not have qualifiers with that, but to have the heart of Christ that brings a heart that shares. You know, it, it powerfully illustrates the golden rule that we find in Matthew 7, 12. Do for to others as you would want them to do unto you. And we see this model happening in the life of the early church. I'll bet one of the reasons why uh, people came to the early church, why we see the explosive growth that was happening in the early church, I believe one of the reasons why we see that is people saw the authenticity of the disciple. They saw the authenticity of the believer. They saw that the believer was putting their money where their mouth was. Then when a believer said that I surrender all to Christ and their life demonstrated that, that was a real world honest testimonial. And therefore, people said, I see you doing it. I can buy into that because you're doing it. It's the right thing because you know that God is asking you to do that. He's asking me. And the church began to grow. Today, we're challenged by that. Is that part of the decline in mainline, um, mainline Christianity? It might be. Because we're no longer striving for what God is calling us to strive for. That we are oftentimes found chasing after the wrong things. So when we give, especially when we do without expecting anything in return, you see, that's what catches the world's attention. When the world sees Christian disciples doing what the world does not teach, that's what gets the attention, and that's what puts the perspective back upon God's people. We also learn that the Macedonians joined God's grace, overflowed in generosity to meet the needs of other people. It overflowed to do that. Paul says that, that, that by sharing this story with the Corinthian church, he was saying, I'm not sharing this so that you will be competitive and feel the pressure to do the same thing. In fact, what Paul says is that's not the reason at all. I'm merely trying to draw you out as a church that you too might experience what the Macedonians are experiencing, that you are experiencing the great goodness of God. And therefore, to have the, the generosity to others well up inside of your life, that you in turn will make a difference. Perhaps that was the same spirit, again, that we saw in the Acts 2 church, where, where we read here, they sold their possessions, they shared the proceeds with those in need, they worshiped at the temple, they met in homes for the Lord's Supper, they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. So Paul says that this whole generosity piece really is what happens in our hearts. One cannot be joyful and not be generous. One cannot have a heart for Christ and not be generous. That generosity and the spirit of generosity comes from God. And therefore, as we embrace and accept that spirit of generosity, we then become divine, genuine acts in the world. And we do that 
because of the grace of God that's giving to us. I also like what Paul says here. He says that, that nowhere am I going to admonish you and tell you the amount that you need to give. He said that basically, some say, well, was he throwing the, the tithe of the Old Testament out the window? Paul was mainly transferring it more into a set number to a sacrificial piece because he knew that through the life of the Macedonians who were very poor, that to expect a tithe from them would not make any sense. In fact, it might even devastate the community thinking that they had to achieve a certain amount of number. So what Paul says is, whatever you experience the grace of God to be in your life, give as an act of his grace in your life. And whatever the means are for which he has blessed you, that is the joyful nature for which you are to give. And that's why he makes the statement, when others couldn't give and you gave more, you helped them. When you couldn't give as much and they were able to give more, they helped you. And the whole body came together in a powerful way. That's another critical piece that as disciples that we learn. There's a, there's a little girl uh, who was um, going to church and her mother wanted to give her a financial stewardship lesson. So she, her mother gave her a dollar and her mother gave her a dime. And her mother says, when you go to church today and when the offering plate comes around, I want you to make a decision as to whether you'll give the dollar or whether you'll give the dime. Do you understand that? She asked her, yes, mommy, I understand. So after church, the mother couldn't wait to understand and to hear what her daughter had done. She said, well, what did you do? And her daughter said, well, I had the dollar in my hand and as the plate was coming by, the man in the pulpit said that I needed to give what I'm giving with a joyful heart. And it brought me more joy, mommy, to give the dime and keep the dollar. And therefore, that's what I did. Paul says it's about attitude. He said it's the attitude of the spirit that lives within us. It is not the amount, but the willingness to give that Paul says matters the most to God. And therefore, when we hold back, when we don't aspire to achieve the grace of what God has given to us, Paul said then our hearts need to be reconciled that something is happening within us that we need to reconcile that. Here's the last piece. The Macedonians begged, begged, I love that word. They begged for the opportunity to sacrifice their meager possessions to others. Now, I, you know, I, one time, uh, years ago, I got a couple of my colleagues together and I said, how many in your congregation are actually begging to give more money to the church? It was like <laughs> crickets, you know, no, not a word, you know. But, but think about that here, and, and this is not something that, that pastors just pull out of their hat to say, oh, look, you have to do this. I think we need to take note of this for the simple reason, what was it that was driving this very poor church to have this spirit of generosity? And that's all the hope I have for us today, is that once somehow we can tune into what made them have that kind of joy, what made them see the grace of God so uh, vibrantly in their life that they would choose to be so generous for the kingdom's work through the life of their local church. Our faithfulness is never measured by the size of the gift. Rather, it is measured by the size of the sacrifice. Did you hear that? Our faithfulness is not measured by the size of the gift, but it is measured by the size of the sacrifice. God searches for the sacrificial heart, He's not only searching for who can give the most. He's looking for who is sacrificing the most. And that's why sometimes we do carry the burden that those of us who have been blessed with great means, hopefully we have a very generous spirit because we are sacrificing in that way. God understands the way that which we view money is a window into our overall principles. It is a reflection of our character. He knows that we put money toward the things that we value and we don't put money toward the things that we don't value. It's like the old phrase says, put your money where your mouth is, and it sums it up. In our faith, it's the same way. It's another thing to give up your cash and support something than to just talk about it. So if we had to be honest this morning, let me ask you a couple of questions as we finish. And I'm asking myself these questions too. Here's the first one. What are the things that we, you, I, we truly value? What are those things? Where does our money go? How do you, how do I, how do we spend our money? Are, are you, am I, are we willing to spend our money the way that Jesus would ask us to spend it? If so, then according to Matthew 10, 8, we're told to give as freely as 
you have received it. It's about the joy that is found in the grace of God. And that is the crux of a disciple's plight to have a heart forgiving.